Well, here we are in Naples, Florida, at the home of Jerome Edwards. And we're going to have a little bit of a conversation with Jerome now and uh, find out a little bit about what makes Jerome tick and uh, share some things with the young directors out there that are looking for some secrets. So, good morning, Jerome. Good morning. And I'd like to uh, begin our uh, conversation with a question that is, why did you decide to become a band director and what were the circumstances that began your band journey? Well, I was in the Bradford County High School Band and I really enjoyed the activity. I mean, greatly. And I was an athlete as well, but band really had a, a, a lot of appeal to me. Music. My first piece of music that I wrote wrote. I was in the third grade and this lady who I think I've, I've credited with a lot of my uh, interest in, in music, Mona Canova, uh, encouraged me to write. And so I didn't write anything but a melody and a, the words to it, but in the third grade I wrote a, a little song about Indians, which uh, I can still remember at least one phrase of it, a young brave was going, and that's you know that's what I remember about it. But it went on and on and on from there, and uh, that was my first thing to find out about music that it was neat and interesting. And then I went through high school. I was very active in the band pro and officer. <clears throat> played my trumpet and uh, fiddled around with some other instruments, but basically I played trumpet. And then when I get to my senior year, <coughs> I tried to decide what did I want to study at college and where was I going to go to college. And at that time I was encouraged, I suppose for the wrong reason, because the ratio of girls to, to guys was seven to one at Florida State. And that sounded uh, interesting <laughs> that there'd be that many girls at a school where there weren't so many guys. In fact, that's where I met my wife, but that... Uh, that was part of how I decided to go to Florida State, not the fact that it had a good music program at that time. But then I had to decide what was I going to study, and I either wanted to be a band director, a coach, or a psychiatrist. And I found out what I would have to do to be a psychiatrist, and I would have to go for many years. The most I could do with a bachelor's degree is count fruit, fruit flies, and I don't think that would be sound very exciting, so that sort of put that one out of the question, because I did have to help raise money to go to college. And then I thought about coaching, and I said, but you know, I probably could coach and still be a band director, maybe. So that's how I backed, sort of backed into the career of music, and boy, oh boy, was it so eye-opening when I finally got to college and found out what you needed to know to be a band director. It well, was not as simple as I thought it would be. You have to be a band director and a coach and a psychiatrist. All of those things have Absolutely. to do work. Yeah. Absolutely. So I got to practice everything I wanted to do in one career. So where did you begin your teaching career? Uh, my first uh, job was sort of dictated by my wife, who was also, I met her at FSU, and she was a year behind me. And... Uh, so I tried to get a class as close as I could, a job as close as I could to Tallahassee so she could finish her degree. And the closest available job was at Appalachian Correctional Institute. And I probably would have taken that job teaching at a prison, but they also wanted me to teach reading as well as band. And I said, I really want to just teach music. And there was another job two miles further up the road at the town of Sneeds, S-N-E-A-D-S, Sneeds. Small town of about 1,200 people with one school that encompassed one grades 1 through 12. And uh, they had a big giant band of about 40. Hmm. And uh, by the time I finished working with it, we had it all the way up to 47. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and it was a good little band because a teacher had been there before me that uh, John Jameson, who... Uh, you remember the name? I Is brought. that Buck Jameson? Buck Jameson. Same guy. Same guy. 
And some of his students were still there, 11th and 12th graders. The ones beneath there were not so good. But because I had the nucleus from his teaching, I was able to quickly develop a band program at that school. And my wife was able to drive back and forth to work, which I might add, she would go to school and it would take her two hours to get there. And then when she'd come back, because of the timeline, she'd be home before she left. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So where did you go from there? Well, once I had, she had finished her, te her, her degree, she taught for a year, then I taught another year, and then I decided to go back to college. I knew I, I wanted to get a master's, and I didn't want to wait too long, and so I went back to Florida State and got my master's in 1963, and uh, in the minimum amount of time possible at that time, which was how much money I had saved, which was less than 11 months. And so I just jabbed everything into that. And then we lived at my in-law's place after I finished my degree, master's degree, during the summer before I could find a job, which was on Lake Placid in the middle of Florida. And if I caught fish, we ate fish. And if I didn't catch fish, we ate tomatoes and rice, you know, <laughs> that's the way it went. Uh, I really enjoyed my job, by the way, at Sneeds. That was a great eye-opener. And I learned the importance of knowing as much as I could because there was no one close by to help. And now uh, there's a lot of people around that will help. But at that time, my closest help was a guy named Jay Brooks Jones at Chattahoochee and Dean Mann at uh, Taylor County High School in Perry. And they were a little far away. Brooks was not so far away, but uh, Taylor County was a little piece from uh, Sneeds. And so I, to get help was a little tough. So you really had to know what you were teaching because there was nobody else to turn to to help you. And that's something that you don't find so much today, but that was a difficulty there. Kind of had to make it up as you went along. That is correct. And I learned probably in my first year, I learned... 75% uh, of what I needed to know and 25% of what I did not ever want to repeat again uh -huh, see. in that first couple of years there. Formative years. Formative years. And then when I did get a job, the next job, it was in the small rural... I wanted to... We, we, we had passed through Naples many times and I really wanted to teach in Naples, but the closest I could get to Naples High School, Naples, Florida, was uh, Immokalee, a small... Farm, rural farming town about 40 miles from Naples. A lot of tomatoes there. A lot of tomatoes and a lot of uh, migrant workers mm -hmm. and uh, some degree of difficulty as far as, uh, again, isolated from all people around me. So what I had picked up in my master's degree was a very useful, uh, uh, very useful to me there at, in Immokalee. And I enjoyed my time there I thought I was going to be there six or seven years, but I only taught there for one year, and then the job in Naples opened up, and I took advantage of that opening and came to Naples High School, and uh, there's where I stayed and finished my career. Well, tell me a little bit about what Naples High School was like when you started there at Naples. <laughs> Naples High School had 16 students signed up for band when I came over. Now, the year before, they had had nearly 40 in the band, but... Along the way, they had uh, some had graduated and some had just moved moved out. So I had to spend the summer going to homes, uh, visiting with parents, visiting with uh, students, and and really work my tail off to get them to give me a chance so that we'd have some kind of a band. And so we we actually had by the time school started, thirty nine in the band. One of the first things at Naples High School that I told them that they had to do was they had to learn to play several pieces of music very well. And there's three, as a matter of fact. Number one, they had to learn to play the school fight song, which I arranged for them. Uh, it had a melody, but it didn't have the harmony, so I arranged it for the band. The number two, th and by the way, they still play that same arrangement Outrageous. today. Uh, and the second thing they had to learn to play well was the school alma mater. And the third thing that every band has to learn to play well is the national anthem. And I said, after you learn those three things, we'll worry about something else. But until we have learned those three items, 
you will just work on those three things. My very first game, I had a man who's long time now deceased, came up with tears in his eyes, and he said how much he appreciated hearing the national anthem and being able to recognize it and its beauty that it's supposed to have through what our band was playing, which led me to believe that maybe the year before he wasn't really hearing it, what he wanted to hear. Oh. So that was the very beginning, and from there we took <coughs> the 39 member band, and the next year it was 62, and the next year it was 97, and from that point we never looked back, and it got into the hundreds and two hundreds from that point. Well, then in that case it grew as you grew. Yes. It grew as I as I grew as I as I learned my trade and get better at what I what I did my my skills as a band director. Uh, the band program grew and flourished here. And then how many years did you stay then at Naples? I was at Naples High School for 27 years. That's, that you might consider a career, wouldn't you? <laughs> Pretty much it was a career. Well, in your time there, uh, I know some people like to move from uh, school to school in order to uh, have to be faced with different problems and different things to deal with. And when you stay in the same place, I don't know that there's a lot of that involved. So what did you do in order to keep your edge and keep your passion flowing for what it was that you were doing? Well, we had guest groups come to this town in 1970. Dr. Ravelli made his farewell concert tour of the country and we filled up the, the largest assemblage ever in the Naples High School Auditorium that seated about 600. Hmm. We had 912 people in that Ooh. auditorium. <laughs> and they were just one of the many, many uh, bands that we had that would come in here. The University of Miami Band came many times here to perform. <clears throat> and we invited clinicians, uh, directors of college bands, outstanding high school band directors who would come and who would help us to get better at what we did. And of course, there was never a time that we had a clinician that I didn't learn something from that clinician. And that includes in my 30th year, as well as it would have been my first year. There's always something that you don't know that the person that you invite to work with your group brings to the table. All right. Could you give me, going another direction here, uh, uh, can you uh, think of, uh, anything about your personal character that you would say enabled you to achieve your high level of musical success? Well, when you think about my character, you have to think of tenacity. Uh, you just don't give up. Another thing that, at least I've been told, I'm somewhat charismatic and that students as well as adults tend to like me, and I'm able to uh, get them to do what I need to do to make the music program work. And I, I might add that that's also the case with the parents who support the band program and, and what they were willing to do to make this Naples High School band work. There were many, many adults and people in the community, doctors, lawyers, architects, and so forth, who were just enthralled by what we did in our band program and who wanted to help any way they could, either through physically fundraising and helping in the things we do that way, or to help within the framework of the band and spread the word about what the band did for their students, their sons or daughters, to other people, which in turn brought more kids into the band program. And I might add that having, and I, you probably shouldn't name, name names but on this interview, but I'm going to name some names. Having Steve Matthews on one aspect of feeding kids from the Golden Gate School area and Harold Moyer here at Gulfview, both of those guys were very good teachers, outstanding, totally different characters, totally different in their way of approach, but the net results they had were outstanding and of course that gave me kids at a higher level to start from where we work with.
dealing with that. Yeah. You, you mentioned parents uh, in, when you were talking there a, a little bit about their involvement. And this day and age involving the parents is, uh, is something that very often frightens young directors. And uh, I, I think that some of the folks that have been around and, and involved with uh, very active band programs for a long, long time have learned the value of parents and uh, what they can do for you. Do you have any words of wisdom on how to encourage that or to foster that, uh, that uh, characteristic of a, of a successful band program, the parents? I think that one, one of the things that you have to do <clears throat> is be honest and sincere with the parents. Let them know what you need, how you need their support. They need to know up front what it is that you need. If you don't tell them what you need, equipment, uh, the kind of support you need, uh, they can sometimes reach a point where they get too helpful. And, and they're not meaning, not, not well-meaning when they're there, <clears throat> you just haven't given them the guidance that you should give them. Think about it long and hard what you want from a band parents organization. What kind of support you need from them, how they can help you, and if you would then lay that framework out for parents in a meeting of parents, they will just chomp to get in that bit and help you any way they can because they're very proud of the band and they want to help. But if you don't set parameters, the help can overwhelm you. Right. They can be often thinking way ahead of you when you really don't <laughs> right. want them to. Yes. Okay. Very good. Well, something else that you uh, uh, kind of uh, hit upon earlier on that I'd like to dig into a little bit deeper is any concepts that you felt were just critical to, uh, uh, to your band program that you had to instill into, the, into your new coming, enter, entering ninth graders, uh, in order to get them to the point that they could produce the kind of music that you expected from them? Well, when you, when you, when you discuss that, it's you have to have consistently fair and firm discipline with every group that you teach. No matter what they are, you have to be consistent and you have to be fair. Now, the firmness... In my case, it was rather firm, very firm. But because the kids saw the results, respected what I was trying to get to, and what we were trying to achieve, they bought into it. But if you are inconsistent, it will not work. Your discipline will not work. And I did, when I was off the music stand, when, I, when you see me step off the podium, I could be there and was one of their very good friends, and in many cases, I was their parent, their mother and their father because they didn't have either one or they did have one or two or live with their grandparents and whoever they lived with they didn't particularly respect so they respected me and I had to step into that role and many times give them counseling, that life counseling. That's that psychiatrist coming back. That's there. a psychiatrist coming back, right. <laughs> Well, uh, since the majority of your, uh, your career was spent in one school, are there any particular challenges that you uh, had to face either early or later on that, uh, uh, that, uh, that you had to overcome in order to maintain what it was that you were doing? I know we had talked earlier about uh, some of the other things band directors have to do or had, are having to do now. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, the first thing when I think of challenges you have to overcome, one of the things that you're going to have to work with as a teacher is you are going to have to work with the following people and work well. The number one person that you've got to work with in your school is the school's principal secretary. She's critical. She's absolutely critical to your success. And then when, when I name the number two person, you're probably going to be shocked but it's the head custodian of the school. Right. You have got to make friends with that person. Right there. Treat them with civility and treat them like they are an equal and not someone that you uh, condescend to. Exactly. They can make your life so much better. The third person in importance is the head guidance counselor. 
you have got to make friends with that person. They can make or break your band program. When you've got that incredible oboe player that can't find a way to get into your, your band, that guidance counselor can find a way to get them in there. And if you don't have that person's uh, support, you're going to wind up losing that incredible oboe player that your old band needs to have. And then, yes, there's the assistant principal. You said, wait a minute, the principal. No, I didn't say the principal yet. The assistant principal, that is the one that is the ear, he has the ear of the principal. You need to get that person on your team. And, of course, it goes without saying that you need to, if you can, have a principal that you have a working relation, good working relationship with. That's very important as well. But if you notice, when I got to that principal, it wasn't the first person. Although that principal can make your life very unhappy if you have not managed to convince that principal that you know your job and that you can do that job and that he can just leave you alone and that job will be done. That's, uh, you mentioned the assistant principal. They're also usually involved in scheduling. Yes, they are involved in scheduling. And the principal, the assistant principal we had for so many years that was in charge of the scheduling said he learned after the first year that he schedules his, the band students first and then builds the school curriculum around the band students because those smart and intelligent kids that are in band are also in many singleton classes that follow. And if he wants to avoid conflicts, he just schedules band students first and then works the schedule around that. A wise AP. Yes, he was. I have uh, a question now that's uh, going to take us off in a little bit of a of a different direction. Are you? Do you consider yourself retired right now? <laughs> I think the day that I will consider myself retired is about three days after I have been laid to rest. <laughs> so, what are you doing now in your retirement? that keeps your creative juices flowing. This past Saturday, I was up in Gainesville adjudicating bands. And I go all over the state. I've even done it out of state, but mostly it's in state. And, and I judge. And I, I gotta say one thing. I love judging concert bands, we all do. I like judging marching bands. And I think we all do. But the thing that is greatest of all to judge and to help are solos and ensembles. Absolutely. That's where you can make the biggest impact and the biggest difference in a student. When E.F. Hutton speaks, and that's what you are when you're the uh, sight reading, or the, I beg your pardon, the solo and ensemble uh, adjudicator, you can give that kid at least one point, sometimes two, but with 10 minutes you don't have a lot of time to do that, but you can give them something that will change their whole concept of playing and can launch them in a totally different direction. I can't tell you how many young band directors have come back and they say, you judge me when in such and such a time. And I remember that you said, and they just tell me word for word, what I said 8, 10, 12, 15 years ago. And so your impact is very strong when you get there. One of my favorite illustrations, and I don't see one nearby here to show you, but I'll just tell you what it is. <clears throat> Brass instruments have such a problem, players, with the correct embouchure. And one of the biggest problems with their embouchure is the teeth. They have their teeth too close together. And it, this works great with trombone players. It works great with baritone players, maybe tuba players. Uh, a little hard to do with the trumpet player, but it can work there too. You just take the pencil and you put it part way. Yeah, up here between the teeth so they can't clench their teeth together. And then you have them play. And they say, we can't play because you've got this pencil. I said, yes, you can. I want you to just blow a note and take in a big, full breath, a really deep yawn, what I call yawn breath, deep right down to your belly button so that you feel like you're going to break your ribs, that kind of breath. And then just blow and keep the sound going through the instrument. And all at once, that kid that's had this little eeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
And finally, finally you pull the pencil away from the message, like, keep your teeth, just like you had them. Try it again. And it's amazing what they can do. It's just a little trick that works it, that when kids can't understand what that clinch teeth does to their sound, and suddenly you've showed them how to separate them. So you're telling us that the proper use of air can help us to create better musical tone qualities. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that air, notice the word air, air plus amateur equals great sound. And you put the two things together. But you have to start with what? Air. <laughs> That's the name of the game. That's the name of the game. Well, we've covered a lot of things in our talk uh, I'm just wondering, and uh, what you've just given us, uh, some wonderful words of advice about air, tone production. Are there any other words of wisdom that you can think of that you'd like to share with uh, young future band directors and present young band directors? I've had a chance to think about this for a number of years, and because of my second career, have had the opportunity to, opportunity to impart this bit of information. So it's great that I'll have a chance to put it on a camera where somebody actually can, can have it for the future. And it doesn't have anything to do with the nice thick band manuals that we all have had over the years, but it has to do with what makes a great teacher. If you have a genuine, deep, passionate love for music, and you are very enthusiastic about the way that you present this to the students, you will be successful. If you have a double doctorate from the University of Michigan and you don't have that enthusiasm for and that passion for music, you're not going to be successful. It's just what it's all about. Now, there are a lot of other things you could think of to say, but that's really what it's all about. That passion has to come through. Your love for music, it has to be there. And you have to present it enthusiastically to those kids for them to buy into it. And if you do, they're going to buy into it. Doesn't matter where you're teaching. Could not agree with you more. Thanks for saying that. And it is on tape now for the world to hear. <laughs> now before we close off our interview, uh, the one thing that I think can be said about us as band directors is over the years we come up with hundreds of stories and interesting things that we could share. And if you had one short story that you could share with us right now that uh, would demonstrate your satisfaction in choosing your life as a band director, what might that be? I thought about this question. And there are a lot of, a lot of things that I could say. Uh, I could say that having a wonderful student like Melvin Maxwell in my band who then became my uh, replacement. replacement when I retired, that I could tell all about his story and that would be a great story. But there are better stories that, that point out the reason that you want to be a band director. I'm going to name another name, <clears throat> which of course the name Melvin Maxwell many of you know, but the name Nina Sue Langevin hardly any of you would know. I would guess none of you would know. Uh, she came into my band program many years back and she knew how to hold a clarinet, she knew how to place it in her mouth, and she knew how to blow air sort of through the clarinet and wiggle her fingers and play some notes. But when you give her the Watkins Farnham performance scale, her score was so low that it was hardly a, you could hardly consider it a score. So I put her into my ninth grade band. I had a separate band class for kids that just didn't have the skills level, and I put her in there and taught her for a year in that class, hoping that she would learn enough that I could put her the next year into the high school band. Well, she tried as hard as any kid ever has tried, and she went from a score that was not single digits, but hardly double digits. She scored a, all the way up to a 38. Well, my minimum for getting into band was a 40. I mean, you just weren't gonna get in. But because she had made such progress, and because she tried so hard, and had worked so hard, I put her into the uh, marching band. She was last chair clarinet, of course, 
But she didn't mind. She was glad to be in the marching band. And she played in the band for all three years that she qualified for it. I, I didn't know what happened to her. She graduated, and I thought that that she was wondered, you know, to see a kid that's hardly able to play an instrument work so hard and then get just barely into the band. And she never did get very far up. And by her senior year, she was still two or three from the bottom. And I wonder what happened to her. Well, this day and age of Facebook and all these other ways of communicating with former students, out of the blue, I get an email from a Nina Sue, and I can't remember what her new last name was. It wasn't Langevin, but she's married. She has three children. And what she learned in band, she tells me that the things she learned in band about life and about citizenship and about being, she has imparted to all of her children and that her best class, her most favorite class of school was band. That was the place where she learned the most in high school. And there's a, that's a bottom chair player just barely getting into the band. And for me to get this email all these years later and see what an impact that had, I realized how much impact we have on our students and the kind of role model we have to be because we don't know, we just really don't know what kind of an impact we make on students. That is so true. And uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful that you have an opportunity you know, to find that out and to find that the, the, the impact that you've had on the kids has been what it has been. It has been a joy talking with you today, Mr. Edwards, uh, certainly. Uh, and just before we close, I'm wondering if there might be anything else that you might like to share with, uh, with us uh, in the way of encouragement or whatever as uh, we close the interview. I was sitting here while I was talking about 92 and I thought of another student that was, well, she didn't make the symphonic band. She played the concert band. She was not able to get to the top band. But she was smart enough, she became the mayor of Naples. Ah. And she used the information that we had at the very beginning of the band manual in bronze, and she kept that on her desk as mayor of Naples. Don't you love it? Work hard when you work. Make a production out of everything. and. Etc. You know, and wow, you just don't know how how much you influence students. You you get an idea thanks to Facebook. You get an idea that you have made an impact. And when you're teaching, you're not thinking about well, I'm going to make an impact on these kids. What you're trying to teach him, and what I'm try what I was trying to teach him, and I this is hindsight now. I find this out after I finished my career, not during my career. <laughs> I wanted them to become an effective citizen in our society and to have a love for all kinds of music, every kind of music. And hopefully, with the efforts that I made, my students have done that. I think you can uh, rest easy, Mr. Edwards. That is certainly the case, at least from <laughs> what I've seen. It has, again, been a joy to speak with you today. And uh, I, I know that people will enjoy seeing this interview uh, on the FBA website. Thank you. Thank you very much.